Hey everyone, um, let's continue our discussion of ecology. Um, like I said in the previous lectures, uh, there are different hierarchical levels at which you can study ecology and natural systems, and so we've slowly been going from the smallest, well, one of the smallest hierarchical levels, which is that the population, um, up to the community, and now we're going to talk about the next level, which is the ecosystem. Um, just because we're a little short on time now, and also because um, there's a lot of content that's already going to be on your final exam, I am cutting out the information on biomes in the biosphere, and we're gonna, the next lecture will head straight into conservation biology, which of course you all know I love. So I'm gonna cut out a little information on there. Um, and I will also um, post an updated course outline too, to let you know which sections on the course outline we're not going through. So let's start with ecosystem ecology. Hold on. There we go. Okay. So ecosystem ecology is the study of um, the relationships and the interactions between and within all parts of the ecosystem. So what we need to do is define what an ecosystem is. I'm sure you've already heard this word before. It's actually very common in people's general speaking now, um, as conservation biology has become more pr popular and prevalent. prevalent. Um, so what is an ecosystem? This includes the living and the non-living parts of the environment. So it's all the organisms that live in the environment plus all their abiotic environmental conditions. So you might be wondering, what are the non-living parts of an ecosystem? That would include things like uh, rainfall, um, nutrients and minerals that are in the environment, um, any climatic conditions, availability of sunlight. Most of the abiotic conditions that you would think of would be uh, climatic conditions. So it includes um, nutrients in the environment as well as the um, climatic conditions that are in the environment. That's what makes up an ecosystem. Um, so, yeah, so what ecosystem ecology does is it studies how the organisms affect the changes in the non-living environment. So you're studying how um, the plants and the animals and the other things that grow there might affect the nutrients that are available in the environment. Um, also, depending on how wide the scope is of the organism in the environment, they also create microclimates within the environment too. So they might actually affect the abiotic parts of the environment. But it's also the study of how the abiotic conditions affect the organisms that are living in that environment. Um, and we'll see in what I'm going to talk about in a little bit that the movement within the ecosystem of the non-living parts is going to take either the form of cycles where the nutrients are moved between various parts of the environment and then transform from one form to another, or it can take um, make just like a straight linear movement. So energy flow through the environment, we're going to see that's only really able to move in one direction through the ecosystem. So first let's talk about ecological succession. Um, and this is the idea that ecosystems will change what species comprise them over time and as they age. Um, Succession is very commonly studied in areas that have been destroyed after a natural disaster. Um, usually things like a tornado or um, mo very, very commonly a volcano. Some of the areas I've worked at in the Sierra Nevada that I've seen succession uh, occurring in are areas that were destroyed by wildfires. That's very common in California. So succession is the... Um, process of recolonizing an area after it's been cleared away or it's a brand new piece of land. Say um, a brand new piece of land is formed from a volcanic eruption. That would be another type of ecological succession. Um, yeah. So let's take the example of a volcanic eruption. So let's say in a certain area of the woods, so this is not brand new land, but land that's already been colonized. Um, you have this volcanic eruption 
all this hot lava and ash. They cover the ground and they kill all the living organisms, which were previously there. Um, and basically what you have is just uncovered rocks, ground, and these hardened lava flows. Um, anything that survives is probably going to die because there's not a lot of nutrients left in this environment. Um, but reestablishment will occur slowly over time. Um, so as this community ages, those rocks um, and the minerals that are in them might start to leach out through rainfall, um, and it'll start to, start to return nutrients to the ground. Um, and you don't need a lot of nutrients for things like lichens and mosses, which we talked about earlier. They, they grow perfectly fine on rocks and other hard things that don't provide a lot of nutrition. Those things are going to be the first colonizers that return to an area that's been destroyed um, because they're mostly using nutrients that might leach out of the rocks and the available sunlight. Um, yeah, so one reason these can grow is that they or fix bacteria from the atmosphere, um, and yeah, I said that. I'm just reading my notes. Okay, so once this stuff starts colonizing, these lichens and these mosses, um, they start to provide their own nutrition in the environment that wasn't there previously. They might actually, as they age and decay um, and die, they might actually start building up a layer of soil in the environment. Um, and this whole process that we're talking about is occurring over hundreds of years. This isn't just like within a short time frame, as you might imagine. So as these things start to add nutrients to the environment as they decay or as they just live, um, then you'll start to see colonizations of grasses and weeds that are taking root in the soil that's forming from these lichens and mosses decomposition. Um, once the grasses start to grow, a second process that's called facilitation um, is going to begin, and it's during this phase they'll have an increase in nitrogen quality on the ground, um, and that'll allow even larger plants to regrow on land. So as these grasses and weeds take root, they're going to um, provide nutrition into the soil themselves just straight from their roots but also as they decay they're adding some structure to it and so that'll allow things with more woody structures that need a little more support to start to colonize after they have been they've been growing there for a while um, so when grasses and weeds colonize and then they start to build up a soil layer that makes it suitable for other one other plants that's called facilitation um, and when I talked about earlier where you have lichens and mosses and things that can grow on hard rocks coming in and colonizing the area that's called establishment. So what you have going on here is establishment and what you have going on here is facilitation aided by the grasses. Um, as you start to attract more herbaceous plants and grasses and weeds, um, then you'll start to attract animals and other organisms which are going to increase the quality of the land through their decay and their poop and things that will increase the quality of the soil and increase the diversity of plants that can grow there. Um, and then as the soil gets deeper, so the more uh, biological processes you have going on there, the more decay and nutrient cycling you have going on, the more decay and nutrient cycling you have going on, the deeper the soil will get so that things that are really tall can eventually start to grow in there like these young tulip poplars, and then eventually you'll get to um, what's called a climax period where you've got beech and sugar maple um, and other types of trees that are growing. And this is hundreds and hundreds of years later after the original disaster that you start to see this. Um, and then eventually when you get this peak growth of the forest, you get the final stage of inhibition. Um, this is when the, the growth of the largest trees in the forest are going to change the area in a way that might actually inhibit the growth of other plants and animals. So you, you sh if you've, well, if you've ever been in any forest around Pennsylvania, depending on how tall they are, you probably have noticed there's not a lot growing on the ground in these forest areas. Um, one reason that's unrelated to succession is white-tailed deer because they're eating everything and destroying it. But another reason you don't see tons of things growing in the understory under trees is because there's not a lot of light available. And so stuff 
that can grow in low shade, low light environments is going to be the only thing that grows down there. So this, that's what's happening when you have inhibition. Um, another thing that you might see, so beech and sugar maple aren't um, coniferous trees, but in succession with coniferous trees, um, they will um, shed their needles periodically. And those needles are really acidic, and they're going to acidify the soil when they fall and decay. Um, and acidification of the soil from pine needles will also inhibit plant growth too because um, only certain types of plants can grow in really acidic soil. Um, yeah, and in the end, depending on the type of environment that you're in, you're going to have different types of climax forests growing. So you might see a, a climax forest like this growing in Pennsylvania, but you're not going to see a climax forest like this in, you know, desert regions in California or other places like that. So it's going to depend on the climate that you're in, too, as the type of climax that you're going to reach with ecological succession. Um, yeah, what else was I going to say? Oh, another really great example. Did I mention this in the last lecture? I think I did. Spruce Flats Bog, that hopefully I'll be able to take my ecology class to in the fall. It's a really, really cool um, place where they logged a bunch of trees in a bog form because it was in a depression and so it's very waterlogged. But that bog is basically, you know, this at this stage in succession. And we might expect over a few hundred years that eventually that bog will again become forest, like the forest that's surrounding it. Um, so bogs are actually a really great example of an intermediate stage of succession going on in um, areas that are being recolonized. Okay, so what else was I going to say? Oh, so let's go over this one more time. So this early, early part of succession, we got... Lichens and mosses attaching to rocks, that's called establishment. This part here, where you have grasses and weeds creating soil so that other um, woody plants can grow, that's called facilitation. That's what's going on here. And then inhibition is what you have in the later stages where things get so tall that they shade out other plants from growing underneath them. Or in the case of like pine trees, the pine needles when they fall acidify the soil and then you... Um, can't have plants that grow in acidic soil here. So you got establishment, facilitation, and inhibition. I talked about that way longer than I want to. I think ecological succession is cool. So let's talk about energy flow in um, ecosystem ecology. One of the primary determinants of the ability of the process of succession is um, in, in being successful is going to be determined by the amount of energy that's available in the system. So if you think, for example, the tundra, um, where I've done a little bit of research, it's in the northern part of the world, um, close to the North Pole. There's not a lot of sunlight there, uh, generally, compared to places that are at the equator. Um, and so there's not a lot of sunlight to support large trees. Basically, um, and the only time I've done field work there is in the summer when it's daylight 24-7. Those are, there's maybe about a eight week period where plants can grow and so because there's only eight weeks in the year when those plants can grow they're very very short and they're stunted and so there's not a lot of energy available in that environment um, for them to grow and that's why you kind of see a lot of miniature plants up there um, so first before we talk about the flow of energy in the environment we need to review um, the first two laws of thermodynamics I bet you're thinking to yourself, what? I never thought I'd have to talk about this again, but you do. Um, so the first law is energy is neither created or destroyed in a system, but it's transferred from one form to another. And the second law of thermodynamics is that all systems will move from order to disorder or entropy, um, or entropy will increase. Um, and in the case of biological systems, this means that at every single step along the way of nutrient cycling and other things in the environment, um, there's going to be energy lost in the form of heat. Um, so it's the first and the second law of thermodynamics. Heat is, for example, is one form of energy that is not um, 
can't be used by biological systems in the transfer of energy. Um, and um, if you think about the flow of energy in biological systems, when we look at the flow of the chemical energy um, in the form of glucose, um, in photosynthesis, and use of this energy by other organisms, you can see that you know it's usually energy is transferred in biological systems via chemical energy and not through heat. Um, and the flow of energy is going to depend on the sources available to the organisms that live there, and this will be determined by the type of metabolism um, that each organism possesses. So some organisms are um, able to capture energy from the atmosphere and use this in the formation of chemical energy. We're going to call these organisms autotrophs, and I think we talked about this earlier in the semester, maybe not, maybe in another ecology lecture. Um, Autotrophs are organisms that can get, actually very frequently not animals, that can get their energy from non-organic sources. Um, one example are photoautotrophs. These are organisms that use photosynthesis, so they're able to transfer light energy into the formation of chemical energy. Um, and we already studied these when we talked about plants and photosynthetic bacteria. Anything that can do photosynthesis... Um, and only uses photosynthesis to obtain energy as an autotroph. There's also really cool things which you'll learn about in my ecology class called chemoautotrophs. Um, these are animal, animals that are able to use chemical, chemical energy in non-organic forms in the environment and use this energy to make the organic molecules. So one example of this is bacteria that's found in um, hydrothermal vents in the bottom of the ocean. They actually, um, there's this hot, like boiling hot, water coming out of these thermal vents in the bottom of the ocean and they actually can use the hydrogen sulfide that's spewing out of these hydrothermal vents as their energy source and all these really weird communities of animals have formed around these hydrothermal vents because of these chemosynthetic bacteria that are able to um, produce energy from hydrogen sulfide the craziest thing I love talking about them in my ecology class. Um, so these are autotrophs, energy from non-organic sources. Um, in either of these cases, um, you can see that the, the primary level of energy flow in the energy system is going to be through these autotrophs. Um, yeah, and these are the organisms that can capture energy in a form that then is used by other organisms, either by... Um, directly consuming the autotrophs um, or by directly consuming something they produce. So they make energy available to all the other stuff that's in the, that system. Um, a lot of organisms like animals and fungi and a lot of microscopic organisms too are not able to make their own organic molecules. These are ones that are heterotrophs. Um, this is an organism that's feeding on another living or formerly living organism for energy and organic molecules. So, um, or their poop, which I guess isn't formally living. Yeah, I guess it is formally living. All poop's probably all dead stuff. Anyway, <laughs> uh, yeah, so heterotrophs have to drive their energy from organic molecules, and they do that by consuming living or formerly living organisms. Um, the heterotrophs are going to be the consumers of this system. Um, and the flow of the energy in the environment, you can think about it in terms of the relationship of these different organisms that are arranged into different levels related to how they obtain their energy within the system. Um, so, and we'll talk about this in the, in the next slide. Um, and all of the animals that are in an environment are going to create this flow of energy through the system. Um, and we can think about this flow of energy um, by the relationship of these different animals, which are arranged into trophic levels. That's what this is called when you're thinking about a food chain. Each of these animals is, forms a different trophic level based on what they're eating. Um, so if we think about the flow of energy in a really simple food chain from plants to insects to shrews, which are these small mammals, to this hawk, these ho the hawk, and then the detritivores, the energy is only flowing in one direction. Um, the food chain is always going to start with an autotroph, and this is because this is the only way the energy can be 
obtained from the ecosystem and passed through organic molecules. Um, because the autotroph in this example, which are plants, are able to capture energy from a non-organic source, they're going to be the primary producers of the system. Um, near the hydrothermal vents that I mentioned earlier, um, back, those chemoautotrophic bacteria are going to be the primary producers. Um, the other trophic levels in the food chain, they're, they're all going to be consumers, and what that means is that they'll rely on at least one level lower to capture energy and provide the organic molecules. So this one's really only... This one is only deriving its nutrition from the sunlight and from the soil, not the abiotic community, and so that's why it's the primary. All the rest of these rely on another level for nutrition. Um, so here's the order of the consumers that we have in this example here. You have um, the herbivores, and this one is just this cute grasshopper. Um, these animals, these are animals that are going to eat the plants. These are the first level of consumers, and they'll take the energy from the plants, and they'll use that as their energy source. Then you have um, primary carnivores. Um, these are small animals that are going to eat the herbivores, so they're only one step removed from the sun. So they're eating the grasshoppers, and the grasshoppers are eating the grass. Um, then you have secondary carnivores. These are the animals that are going to eat the primary carnivores. These are the hawks, and they have the detritivores. Um, everything in life dies, and this requires an additional group of consumers that's going to eat the dead organisms and process them um, and contribute them back into the cycle. Um, detritivores are really, really important in ecosystem functioning because um, they're the ones that make all the stuff that dies. They release the energy that's available in that, and they make it available... Um, in the soil to the plants so that they can grow. Um, they're really, really important. Um, and here we've got mushrooms and bacteria and vultures and other things that break down dead animal and plant tissue. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the productivity. So when we talk about productivity in ecosystems, this is the amount of energy which is able to be captured and used at each of the levels in the ecosystem. So I'll repeat that again. Productivity is the amount of energy which is able to be captured and used at each of the levels in the ecosystem. That's what productivity is when we're talking about it in, in, in this ecological context. And this is measured in the amount of organic molecules which can be synthesized at each trophic level. So how much of the energy is available that can be passed to the next level. Because only the autotrophs are able to capture the energy, their productivity is always referred to as the primary pr productivity. Um, and you can summarize this in two ways. There's gross primary productivity. Um, this is the total rate at which the primary producers will make new organic molecules. So I'll, write, I'll read that again. GPP is the total rate at which the primary producers will make new organic molecules. And as we'll see in a little bit, the GPP is going to be determined by the moisture lever level and the amount of sunlight that's available in the particular area. You can also measure it in net primary productivity. Um, in addition to photosynthesis to make new organic molecules, um, the primary producers are also going to use some of this energy through respiration. And this energy will be related to the loss of energy as heat, and therefore NPP is... GPP minus the energy loss through respiration. I'll repeat that again. MPP is gross primary productivity minus the energy lost through the respiration that the primary producers are doing. Um, there's also secondary productivity. Since the consumers will use the energy from the primary producers, there is um, some productivity, in other words, a transfer of energy, from one organic form to another, another, and this is referred to as secondary productivity. They're not capturing the energy from the non-organic form, but using organic forms to make different organic molecules. That's what is this, this is all referred to as secondary productivity here. These are the primary pro producers doing primary productivity. So let's talk about energy flow a little more. Um, 
When we were looking at that food chain, you should have been able to see that the movement through the food chain and each step, there's going to be some loss of energy as the ecosystem, as the energy moved through each level within it. And in fact, most of the energy that enters the Earth's atmosphere in the form of solar energy isn't captured by plants. And only about 1% of the available energy that's used by plants is actually used to make organic molecules. So sort of inefficient. Um, and it's kind of surprising there's life on Earth at all when you think about it. Um, this is the, the energy that is captured and made available is um, the energy that's captured and passed to the next level. And in general, about 10% of the energy will be captured and used within each higher level of the food lab. So you're losing energy through each, each time it passes through the food web. Um, so where is the energy lost in each of these trophic levels? The primary loss of energy is usually in the form of heat, and that's the energy that's released during the process of respiration. And here we're just looking at energy being lost by this grasshopper. Um, some of the energy is consumed, but it's never actually used by the organism at the next level, and that's energy that's lost through feces. And then the remainder of the energy will be used by the organism for growth, um, which will either be transferred to the next other level or it'll be lost during death. Um, some of a very, very, very small portion of the energy that's lost in feces and through death um, can be consumed and released from, from detritivores, but a very, very small amount. Um, Oh, I just said that. Okay. So one of the key points to note here is that um, at each level up of the trophic level, you move there, there's required the consumption of larger number um, of the level below to meet the needs of the organism because they lose so much energy through trying to eat this thing. They have to eat a lot of it to gain enough energy to power the, the metabolism of this organism. Um, and so the, this loss of energy at each step is going to result in a limitation on the growth of the top levels of the food chain. And there's a need um, for so many of the levels below, there's only the ability to support a small number of animals at the highest level. So this is that's why you don't see tons and tons of predators in environments is because it is energetically costly to make enough energy available to those really, really top predators like lions and bears and other large predators in different environments. Wolves, not a lot of wolves around. So let's talk a little bit about energy transfer in one particular ecosystem. Um, the example that's shown here is in the um, Cayuga Lake ecosystem in upstate New York. This lake is home to a number of primary producers, algae, cyanobacteria, which are going to capture the energy from the sun. And if you consider how the energy, how much energy is passed through the system, um, let's think about how a thousand calories from the sun captured in the primary producers would be used at each level. So of that thousand calories, only about 150 calories are captured by the herbivores in the lake. Um, and the, this is being the phytoplankton and other small invertebrates. When those are consumed by smelt and other small fish in the lake, they're able to recover only about 30%, 30 of the original 1,000 calories. And then this, the smelt are food for both humans and trout in the lake. And if those are eaten directly, they'll provide six of the original 10,000 calories to the trout or the humans eating them. Um, However, uh, a lot of people prefer trout over smelt, and of the original 1,000 calories captured from the sun, only about 1.2 calories will be captured by a human consuming that trout. So hopefully this example illustrates to you that it takes a large number, a huge number of photosynthetic organisms to support the growth of a single person on a single piece of trout from the lake, and only a small percentage of the energy from the sun will reach the highest level of the consumers. At each level, there's there will be energy loss through the respiration, and additionally, you can think about how the process of capturing the prey at the next level 
and increase the energy expenditure. Um, we need more energy to catch the trout than the herbivores will use to capture the plant, the phytoplankton. So that's another release of energy through respiration. Um, and you can also think about how this might have an impact on human diet and agriculture. So when humans eat plants, there's um, the ability to capture more energy directly from the sun, remembering that, of course, that the energy in the plants um, can't be digested by animals, um, not all of it anyway, because of the cellulose. Um, if you also think about the animals that we um, use for human consumption, like cows, pigs, and chickens, each one of these are to some extent herbivorous, um, which makes sense because um, if we had to feed them meat all the time, that would be extremely energetically costly um, to maintain them in agricultural settings. Um, yeah, so it'd be much harder for us to like have some sort of agriculture, have some sort of carnivore as an agricultural commodity and source for meat than for a cow or a pig or a chicken because they're consuming plants um, and not something as energetically costly as eating meat. Um, yeah, so that's an example from agriculture, thinking about the efficiency of energy transfer. Um, you can also talk about the relationships in an ecosystem through the use of a trophic pyramid. Um, and in these figures, um, the size or the length of the bar is going to represent the amount of biomass or energy which will be used um, for the high, highest carnivores to be able to live. Um, and you'll notice that to support one top carnivore, it will take almost four million of the primary producers. And you can see that same type of relationship is seen at the size of the biomass at each level. So um, this is also a really great way of illustrating the energy that is required in a system um, to support these uh, higher level consumers within the trophic um, levels. So you can... As you might know already, a lot of ecosystems are in a really delicate balance and they function with very well. All the animals that are in an ecosystem function really well with each other because they've been evolving a relationship with each other over millions and millions of years. And so any disruptions in that food web can dramatically shift the uh, energy flow through the system um, and cause really big changes in um the dynamics of the animals and plants that live there. So um, in this example of this food chain or food web that's shown here, um, this the presence of this carnivorous fish will have a significant impact on the growth of algae. So in this example, um, when you have the fish, the fish will keep the balance um, correct in the lake to prevent the overgrowth of the algae. But when the fish are absent, there's a much lower number of primary carn carnivores, um, <clears throat> or there's much higher level of primary carnivores like these damselflies, um, which allows the herbivorous insects um, to reduce the amount of algae that's in the system, or actually it increases. So what's happening here is that the damselfly without the fish is consuming all these this its population skyrockets because it's not being eaten by fish and then these in turn cause a decrease in the herbivorous insects decrease in the herbivorous insects causes a huge increase in the algae population um, but when the fish are in the population they they eat these um, damselfly nymphs and that keeps um, the population of herbivorous insects high um, which are then feeding on the algae to keep the algae um, population low. And so when you remove fish from the system, it kind of messes up the energy flow and the balance within it. So let's talk a little bit about these cycles that we have seen occurring in these ecosystems. Unlike energy, where there's a constant addition of energy to the ecosystem, which is in the form of sunlight from the sun, um, the elemental components of the ecosystem, there are only a fixed number of atoms of any type present on Earth. 
Um, because there's not the addition of more atoms to the ecosystem, the, the use of these materials in the ecosystem will be defined by how the materials are moved from one form to another and how this changes as they move through the different levels. The cyclical nature of the movements here are described as uh, biogeochemical cycles. Um, and this term is used because, as we'll see, the water movement is not limited just to the atoms present in the biological organisms alone. Um, we'll see as we talk about in a couple of these cycles that the presence in the ground or the abi abiotic parts of the ecosystem are actually going to make up a large portion of the cycle. Um, additionally, uh, the, the geo part of biogeochemical cycles will include the air and the water as well as forms um, found in the ground or geology of the ecosystem. Um, and the movement of the elements in the ecosystem is going to entail the interaction of different levels as the earth changes and either through the natural processes or through the activities of humans there are changes in this, the stores and the sources of different chemicals in the atmosphere. Um, so let's go through the water cycle just quickly. You might not have learned this since I know I think everyone learns this in middle school now, but let's just go over it again as a refresher. Um, water, as you already know, is one of the most central molecules on, of life. Um, the basic chemical properties of water make it essential for life in all forms, and the movement of water through the different parts of the ecosystem will help to determine the limits to growth. Um, the water cycle is really well covered in your books, so we're not going to talk a lot about it um, here, um, but make sure you look through these figures and see how it goes through. We'll also actually cover this a lot in my ecology class as well, um, and make sure you understand how water um, will change as it moves through the environment. So let's talk about the cycling of nitrogen through ecosystems. Nitrogen is the most abundant molecule in the air, um, but one, a small amount of nitrogen in the ecosystem is able to be used by the organisms on Earth. And so the shift of nitrogen through the different forms often makes it a limiting element in the process of growth in an environment. Um, think back to what I just said earlier about succession. succession. Um, the accumulation of nitrogen is one of the key elements which will be required for growth in an area. So um, when those lichen and those moss are growing in those areas, when they are establishing new growth in a new area, that's been destroyed or has never been colonized before, what they're doing is that by um, growing in that environment themselves and then by di dying and decaying, they are making nitrogen available for other organisms, other organisms to then move in. Um, so what are the primary forms of organic nitrogen in organisms? Um, amino acids that are in proteins and to a much lesser extent, nucleotides are also included in that, but most of it is through amino acids. Um, because the movement of nitrogen in the process is a cycle, we can kind of start anywhere in the cycle and come back around to the other forms. Um, so let's start with the molecular form in the atmosphere because this is the most abundant form, um, but is only limited, has a, a limited availability to be used. So let's talk about nitrogen fixation. Um, what organisms have we talked to? Think a little bit about what organisms we've talked about already this semester that are able to take f fix nitrogen from the air into a form that can be used by plants. I'll let you think. Do, 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 do. Okay, that's long enough. Rhizobium! <laughs> so if you didn't remember, um, Rhizobium are great nitrogen fixers. Um, what they do is they take nitrogen from the molecular form and they make it into a form which is able to be used and absorbed by the plants, which is nitrate and ammonium. So nitrogen fixers are ones that take nitrogen in the molecular form, or nitrogen fixation is when an animal or a plant or a bacteria, I don't know why I said that, when an organism <laughs> takes nitrogen, uh, and it 
in the molecular form and then makes it into a form which is able to be absorbed and used by other organisms. That's called fi nitrogen fixation. Um, in addition to rhizobium, um, there's also a number of bacteria in the soil and in the water that go through the process of nitrogen fixation. So it's mostly um, fungi and bacteria that are able to do nitrogen fixation, mostly bacteria. Um, and then the and then that, that nitrate and the other forms of nitrogen can then be used by the plants to make amino acids and nucleotides. Um, there's also nitrogen assimilation right here. Um, this is when nitrogen is taken up by the plants and other bacteria um, can be made into an organic form. Um, that's nitrogen assimilation. So this is when nitrogen is taken up by plants and other bacteria can be made into an organic form. Um, this makes the nitrogen available to be assimilated into other organisms, um, namely the heterotrophs, which will consume the plants or bacteria and use this to continue up the food chain and the use of nitrogen. So first got nitrogen fixation, then nitrogen assimilation, and then there's also ammonification. Um, animals will use some of the amino acids in the nucleotides for the purpose of energy metabolism. And in this case, the excess nitrogen is going to be excreted in a form that can be broken down um, or, it, or made directly as ammonium. Um, so this ammonification is when animals use some of the amino acids um, or use some of the nitrogen to make amino acids and nucleotides, and then they excrete the excess nitrogen, usually in the form of ammonium. Um, so basically, ammonification is the process by which nitrogen is transformed into ammonium. And as I already mentioned, um, this will produce a form um, which will be used by the plants and bacteria, um, but is of little use to any heterotrophic organisms. Um, and additional sources of ammonia can come from the decomposition of a dead organism. Um, and in this way, plants may lead to the increase of ammonium in the soil and water as they die. There's also nitrification. So some of the ammonium that's in the soil in the water will be oxidized to nitrate and nitrite through the process of nitrification. Um, and as I mentioned above, this process is used by plants and bacteria as a source of nitrogen for assimilation. And then you also have um, dentrification. So to complete the cycle, some of the inorganic nitrogen in the soil and the water will be reduced by microbes in the soil and the water to return the nitrogen to the atmosphere in the process of dentrification. Um, this process, dentrification, is basically denitrification. is basically the reverse of nitrogen fixation, but there will be the, the way that some bacteria use the nitrogen as a source of reducing power to allow for um, generation of the energy. So you, you should be able to see through this process where there's a proper balance um, in the use of this nitrogen and that there's a constant cycling of it to provide for all the needs of the organisms. Um, and any loss or addition of the source of nitrogen is going to cause a change in the balance um, of that ecosystem. So let's talk a little bit about agricultural practices in the nitrogen cycle. Um, you can kind of see how this nitrogen cycle may go awry, um, best demonstrated through agricultural use of nitrogen. So if you think about the, the addition of nitrogen through fertilizers, that can change the ecosystem of the surrounding area. Um, farmers will commonly apply large amounts of ammonium to the soil when they're planting seeds, and this ammonia will supply a high level of nitrogen for the young plants and give them a head start. Um, the ammonium that's applied to the field is going to go through nitrification, which makes it more easily absorbed by the plants. Um, but because they've uh, the farmers apply it in such excess, a large amount of the nitrogen will leach off the field as rains come, and the leaching of this off the field will increase um, the amount of nitrogen in the water in the streams and lakes around the field and the increase in nitrogen in the water will cause a rapid increase in the growth of algae in the water um, and those are commonly referred to as algal blooms. Um, 
as the algae grows, it'll also begin to die. Um, then it sinks to the bottom of the water, where it's decomposed by bacteria and fungi in the water. Um, and through the decomposition, it's going to the decomposition by bacteria and algae requires oxygen for respiration. And as these bacteria and fungi are breaking this up and using up all the oxygen, the reduced oxygen in water is going to cause a death of the fish. Um, and so this is just one example of how having too much nitrogen in, a, in an ecosystem can really cause some detrimental effects um, to the balance that's there. Um, there's all, you can use organic forms of nitrogen um, with um, perennial crops. Um, in this case, the nitrogen is applied in a form that will require additional time to break down. So like dead plant man matter or manure. Um, this process means that the nitrogen will go through ammonification before nitrification um, to allow for the uptake of nitrogen by the plants. And this slow release of the nitrogen for the plants will limit the amount of nitrogen which leaches or washes off into the field and may help limit the algal bloom in the waterways around the field. Um, so much better to use something like manure or plant material than just straight up ammonium chemical fertilizer because it takes longer to decay and will um, leach much slower into the natural environment. Deforestation can also affect the nitrogen cycle in ecosystems. Um, in a normal forest, the breakdown of the organic material on the floor is a really slow process um, in which the nitrogen will never leave the area. And as the process of decomposition of the leaf matter re-enters the soil, the trees will absorb the nitrogen and prevent it from leaving the forest. Um, but through the process of clear cutting, this really upsets that balance. Um, this is just an example of a Hubbard the Hubbard Brook Forest in New Hampshire. There, there's been an ongoing experiment to see how changes in the methods of lumber collection can impact other areas of the ecosystem. So in the case of the nitrogen cycle, it was found in areas that have been clear cut that there's a significant increase in the washing out of um, nitrogen out of the woods as a result of clear cutting. Um, in areas in which all the trees have been removed, which is just straight deforestation, there was a really high significant increase in the amount of nitrogen in the streams around the area. So if you think about this as the trees are removed, even if the process of ammonification and nitrification slows down, the lack of trees to take up the nitrogen means that they'll more, be more able to wash off the formerly forested area that's there. So the, the loss of the trees in the end reduces the recycling of the nitrogen and therefore increasing the loss of nitrogen, which may lead to another algal bloom, and they, like in the example we talked about before. Um, and it's going to change the ecology of the streams that are around the forest because it's just getting washed out into the streams instead of taken up by the trees. Um, so these are two examples that show how changes in any part of the nitrogen cycle may lead to changes in other areas around the originally impacted area. So let's consider um, the example of how we can label the, the molecules and then follow them through the cycles. So if you did that extra credit bio blitz with the Fisarum, um, you, you might want to see how the rhizobium with the Fisarium would affect the movement of nitrogen in the cycle. Um, I'm not going to go over that though because not everyone did it. But these are two really great examples. Um, that deforestation example um, in this one talking about agricultural practices are really great examples of showing how um, human activities can alter nitrogen cycling in an environment to a, the detriment of the environment. Now let's talk about the cycling of carbon in the environment. Um, this is the most central atom to changes in the organic organism and, and is used in, the, in reuse of carbon. Um, carbon forms the basis of all the organic molecules. These are all the molecules of life, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, um, and 
These will be used by the organism to make the basic units of life. As with the nitrogen cycle, we'll start with um, the gaseous form of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Um, so how is CO2 made into organic molecules? Um, the process of carbon fixation um, in photosynthesis by the plants and through cyanobacteria. Um, the organic carbon which is formed can form the basis of the food for the heterotrophic organisms like the animals, um, which will use this carbon for growth and energy metabolism. These animals will also return a lot of the carbon dioxide to the atmosphere through um, further respiration, and in this case, this, the carbon dioxide is now able to be reused by the plants um, to, to grow further um, and make more organic molecules and continue the process. Additionally, when plants and animals die, the detritivores are going to decompose the dead organisms and return more carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Um, in aquatic ecosystems, this is the, essentially the same process is going to occur. Um, there is one major difference, that is the um, CO2 in the atmosphere will have an additional location of storage that is dissolved in the water as um, carbonic acid that you learned about in lab. Um, some bacteria that are in anaerobic conditions will be able to use carbon um, in organic forms to make methane, which is also released into the atmosphere, um, but most of this methane is quickly oxidized in the presence of oxygen um, to CO2, and this will be returned to the atmosphere. Um, let's talk about some additional storages of carbon in the carbon cycle. Um, some of the organic carbon in dead organisms isn't completely returned to the atmosphere in the form of CO2, um, but it will become buried in the ground and undergo geologic processes which turn it into coal and oil, which are fossil fuels. Um, because there's only a limited amount of carbon in the environment, this will represent a form of carbon which is um, captured in the ground. And over a long period of time, the continual storage of carbon in this form in the ground will result in a reduction in the total amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is, but this is an extremely long process. It takes a very long process to form coal and oil fossil fuels, millions of years. Um, but with the use of fossil fuels, um, coal and heat and oil in the form of gas for cars, there's an increase in the amount of carbon which enters the atmosphere in the form of CO2, and this results in a shift in the form of carbon in the cycle. So let's talk a little bit about climate change in the carbon cycle. Um, in, within the last two decades, there's been a lot of attention on the impact of this increase in concentration of carbon dioxide and a lesser extent the methane in the atmosphere and how this may change the temperature on Earth. Um, as I just said, you can see how the increased consumption of fossil fuels is going to increase the amount of carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere. When the increase in CO2 gradually increase, um, increase in growth of plants in warmer regions of the world could compensate to increase the amount of carbon dioxide captured. Um, but with increased emission of carbon dioxide, um, this has outlasted the growth of the plants and the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has dramatically increased, uh, particularly since the Industrial Revolution. Um, so how does this increase relate to changes in the temperature of the Earth? Um, as I mentioned earlier, when sunlight enters the Earth's atmosphere, there's only a small percent of the energy that's actually captured by the photosynthetic organism. Most about 99% is actually released into the atmosphere in the form of heat energy. Typically, a lot of this heat simply just radiates back into space and isn't retained on Earth, um, but the presence of greenhouse gases like methane and CO2 in the atmosphere as the energy is being radiated back towards space, this will um, contact the molecule which will cause it to be reflected back into the atmosphere. Um, and you can think about this as, as kind of like how a greenhouse works. Um, the light that enters the greenhouse is going to be reflected back to the plants by the glass that make up the walls and the roof to keep the roof warm and allow the plants to grow. Um, so that's why this is called the greenhouse effect is because you're causing light and heat and radiation to bounce off 
this extra layer of carbon dioxide, this thicker layer of carbon dioxide that we've added heating the air to a higher temperature. And so this will result in increase, so all of our um, increased emissions of CO2 and methane in the atmosphere are going to cause um, a reduction in the radiation and the heat and therefore um, the radiation and the heat back out into the solar system and that increases the temperature worldwide because this layer is around the entire Earth. So what are some of the impacts of this increased temperature? Um, as you can imagine, um, the increased temperature of the Earth will cause melting of the ice, which will increase the levels of the ocean and may threaten the cities in, in the area around the ocean. So think about New Orleans. Um, many of the parts of the city are actually below sea level, which means long term the city may flood over. Um, more immediate effects that can be seen in other areas um, are cor coral bleaching. Um, the growth of corals in the oceans is a result of a symbiotic relationship between the coral itself and then also a photosynthetic algae called zooxanthellae, which live in the tissues of the coral, and that's what gives them their distinctive colors. They are the ones that provide energy for the growth of the coral, and the cor coral pro provide protection to the zooxanthellae. And when the water temperature increases, the protozoans die, which will threaten the life of the coral. Um, if the temperature is lowered again, the protozoan will return and the coral will recover. Um, and this is seen in some seasonal changes in, in the water around the coral. Um, but the bleaching of the coral because of the loss of the protozoan will cause the coral to lose color. However, if the temperature remains high for too long, the protozoans can't return and the coral eventually will die. And this is a threat to the whole ecosystem as the coral provide location for fish and other species to grow. They're also a food source, um, so it's really detrimental. Increased temperatures also increase the spread of malaria and spread of other diseases that you might be able to think about. Um, as we've talked about with malaria a lot before, the range of malaria is limited by the growth of the particular mosquito, that the Aedes mosquito, which c carries the parasite, which then infects the human population when they bite them. As the temperature warms further in northern regions, the mosquito is able to, to move its population farther north and then spread the diseases with the changes in the temperature. Um, in the United States, in the 80s, malaria was really only found in California, um, but in sort of more recent years, it's been found in other parts of southern states where there have been a few cases, and also even a few cases found in more northern states in the United States. Um, malaria, and along with other tropical diseases, um, could threaten the health of many areas which aren't ready to deal with this threat. So um, I'm not going to talk about it extensively right now, but it's important to know that uh, pandemics and other diseases can be, and their spread, can be directly impacted by climate change. And that's all I'm going to talk about for this lecture. Um, stay tuned for the next lecture where we're going to talk about um, conservation biology and some human impacts on the environment in a little more detail. Okay, bye-bye.